Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. How do we expand in those moments? Well, the first piece is the meditation. Most of us, sadly, try to develop a spiritual practice in the midst of a crisis. And it's very, very difficult. In the midst of stress, in the midst of a crisis, when that rock has landed in the glass and the water's doing this and splashing all out, that's going to be a very difficult time to suddenly try to remember, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember when I was in Rishikesh and I heard this satsang, I'm not supposed to be a glass, I'm supposed to be the ocean. It's good to remember it, but it's going to be very, very difficult in that moment to implement it. This is why we begin a daily practice. Think for a moment about anything. Say you want to learn to drive a car. Well, anybody who's ever learned to drive a car knows that there's a long period of time before you're allowed on the freeways. First, you have to have somebody who can drive sitting next to you. In America, you can get a driver's license at 16, but at 15, you get your permit. And with your permit, you have to have someone who's an adult sitting right next to you. And then there's a long time you're not allowed on certain freeways and whatnot. Why? Because until I've got my reactions in place, it's not a technique, Driving a car, particularly an automatic car, not a stick shift car, really is not rocket science. It's very few skills. It's keep the wheel straight and keep your foot on the accelerator. What needs such a long time to get perfected is my instincts. So that if I'm driving down the road and somebody comes out after me, from the side, from behind, they're in the wrong lane. I don't have time to think at that point. I don't have time to think, oh, right, if I turn the wheel to the left, the car will go to the left. Okay, this guy's showing up on my right. It means I should turn the car to the left. You'll be dead by that point. And you'll be dead long before that point. The minute you start to say, okay, now wait, it's over. What they hope is that by the time you're driving down freeways where people go really fast, it's become so much second nature that you are able to just react in that moment without even thinking. You put your hand on a hot stove. Long before you have a thought that this stove is hot, your hand is already off. If you wait to have the thought, oh, this is a very hot stove, I'm probably going to burn my hand. Yeah, I think I should probably remove my hand from the stove. Your skin will be off. So we have to develop whatever it is we're trying to learn to do, whether it's drive a car or whether it's move through the world peacefully, joyfully, with an expanded consciousness, knowing who we are. 
we have to begin not in moments where the glass is already shaking. Just like you can't begin to figure out how to drive a car going, you know, 120 kilometers an hour down a freeway with cars coming from the sides, bullet carts coming this way, people not stopping, weaving. You've got to learn to drive on a nice wide road, little road, your, your residential road where there's nobody coming in the other direction, maybe no other cars. So in our spiritual practice, it's actually really similar. It's similar to any, any technique or skill. This is deeper. This is an awareness. But it takes the same pathway where it has to go from being a conscious effort to being something that goes into the subconscious and then even into the unconscious awareness. So we begin with meditation. First, we have to have the experience of being the ocean. Just because I'm sitting here telling you you're not the glass, you're the ocean. That the only reason that you're having these reactions are because somebody's dropping a pedal and a pebble and you think you're so small it's reacting. You have to have the experience. I can sit up here and tell you about my lunch, but that's not going to ease your hunger. You've got to actually eat it. If you're hungry, reading all the menus in the world, reading all the cookbooks in the world, listening to all the lectures of all the people describing their meals is not going to give you that experience. So this is why we meditate, is to first have the experience of an expanded consciousness, to have the experience of being the ocean. One of the first things that happens when we meditate is you lose, you lose a sense. Like sitting here right now, I'm, if I bring my awareness to the body, I can be very aware of where the bottom of my leg ends and where this couch begins. I can bring my awareness to where my you know, chest ends and my jacket begins, to where my back ends and the pillow behind me begins. But when you meditate, one of the very first things that happens is we lose that sense of awareness of where our leg ends and the cushion we're sitting on begins. So this is a very, very common thing. And if you allow yourself to be aware of it, you'll notice it. Whether you're doing a meditation with mantra, whether you're doing a meditation on the breath, whether you're bringing your awareness to your third eye, it doesn't matter what meditation we're doing. But as we meditate, by default, this awareness of the self starts to expand. First, into just the world around us, that line blurs between my leg and the cushion. Maybe there's a fan that's blowing some air. And not only do I feel the air here on my arm because the fan is on that side, but maybe I start to feel the air actually blowing through me. These are, these are common experiences that people have in meditation. And the reason for that is it gives us an awareness of an expanded self, of actually being the ocean. Then what we do is as we move through the world, through easy situations, I'm making dinner. I'm doing the dishes. I'm walking down the road. Situations that are not confrontational. Situations where people are not throwing rocks into us. I allow my awareness to keep expanding. Can I become one with the vegetables in my hands? Can I become one with the suds and the sink and the plates? Mindfulness. 
But mindfulness, it's not just mindfulness. When we think of mindfulness, we think of just the fact that I'm not allowing my mind to wander. So washing dishes, washing dishes, washing dishes. But in addition to that, not just washing dishes, but can I allow myself to have an experience of becoming one with the water that's running out of the tap into my hands? As I feel that water make my fingers wet, well, we're, we're becoming one. As my fingers become wrinkly in the suds in the water, I'm kind of merging into that water in suds. Just whatever it is I'm doing, I and mean, I'm giving you sort of silly, easy examples to realize that whatever we're doing in life can become a way to meditate. And as I do that, as I practice, and particularly then I take it the next step in my interactions. So I'm speaking to someone. Well, instead of just speaking to you as you over here, as I'm talking to you, or as I'm just standing near you, can I allow my awareness to shift from my body and your body to my spirit and your spirit? Can I start to feel a place where we connect, a place where we vibrate together? And if I can't feel that immediately, let me begin with my breath. Let me notice the fact that what I'm exhaling is merging into the air and she's inhaling over there and she's exhaling and it's merging into the air and I'm inhaling over here. So that's a simpler way to feel connected. But then let me take it down onto a spirit level. There's a place where we, we vibrate together. The bodies are just our vehicles. But there's this spirit that runs through all of us. And so I, I allow that to become a meditation in action. You know, one of the things people ask all the time is, how, how can I have more of a spiritual practice? Like, I don't have enough time to meditate. Or maybe I do meditate, but I've only got 10 minutes a day, and I wish I had more time, or I'm too busy to even start a practice. Or I've got a practice and I love it, but God, you know, my job, and I've got this commute and the kids and the errands. This is a way to make whatever you're doing meditation. Because what we're taught in the scriptures is every single thing in the universe is pervaded by the divine. And if everything is pervaded by the divine, then I should be able to connect with the divine in everyone. And that becomes a great practice. So I allow as much as I can in my life, whether it's in my workplace, in my family, running my errands, walking the dog, whatever I'm doing, I allow it to give me an opportunity to expand my consciousness. It's much easier, I tell you this from experience, it's much easier to do it with natural things, I find. Easier to expand into a sunset, into a river, into a tree, than into a car, for example, or a chair. So we begin with natural things than people. A lot of times it's easier to begin with connecting to a tree than connecting to a person because we don't tend to have issues with the tree. We don't have expectations from the tree. We're not worried about what the tree is going to think about us. But wherever we are, whatever we do, we allow that to become an opportunity. To just wonder, well, if I didn't, if I didn't assume that I ended over here and you began over there, what might a different possibility be? Might that be the big illusion that you and I are separate when actually we're one? And wow, what would, it, what would it feel like to be not only me over here, but to be you over there? So that I've got enough of that in my awareness, in my consciousness, in my sense of self, 
that when a rock falls into my metaphoric glass, I've already got the training and the technique into my awareness such that I can just breathe. And in a breath, I'm expanded. You know, Pooja Swamiji says when you first build a house or a building and you've got to lay all of the electrical wires, it takes a really long time. Lots of planning, blueprints, you've got to call the electrician. But once all that's been done, now if you just want to turn on a lamp, all you've got to do is plug it in. You don't have to rewire the house every time. But if you don't, rewi if you don't wire it first, doesn't matter how great your lamp is, you've got no place to plug it in. So our spiritual practice is this wiring of our house so that when experiences happen, we're able, with a deep breath, with a closing of the eyes, to reconnect, to plug ourselves in. The mantra for me is like a life raft, literally. It is something that carries you across, that you can grab onto, literally. It's, I'm drowning in this ocean of my mind, and the mantra is, yes, the life raft that you grab onto and that carries you. Whatever tools you have, there are so many rocks. There are so many people pushing our, our glasses, our bathtubs. Use it all. Chant the mantra, breathe deeply. Whatever you've got, they'll both help. The, the, the breath grounds you immediately. For me, the breath just immediately grounds me. If I can bring it low in my abdomen, it's just an immediate grounder back into, ah, oh, this is who I am. Because when we get stressed, it becomes all here. If you notice when people get very stressed, the pitch of their voice raises face gets flushed. It's like all of the energy of the body, the prawn of the body, is pulled out of its core, out of its center, and just up here, and we get that screechy little... Otherwise, why in the world would our voice change? Because I've pulled myself, all that energy, out of this grounded core, and up into my head space. So the breath grounds you, and the mantra carries you across. Is it the mind or is it the spirit? So I think about someone, and immediately they call me. When we're connecting, what is, what is connecting? Are we connecting to some sort of universal mind or universal spirit? What there is, is consciousness. When we speak about spirit, it's this consciousness. These are all words that are kind of actually going around a truth. None of them fully able, particularly in the English language where we just don't have this, this mystic tradition. There are words going around a truth, but what we have is consciousness that is unbroken. A good way to think about it, not a perfect metaphor, but a good way to think about it is the ocean with waves on the ocean. So when you have a wave, it's still ocean. It hasn't stopped being ocean in order to be a wave. It just temporarily has taken this form of the wave. Now the question is, is the wave real? Or is the wave an illusion? It's both. If you think it's separate from the ocean, it's an illusion. If you think it's a separate thing, it's an illusion. Because really all it's ever been is ocean. And yet, yes, on another level of existence, there really is this form 
that ocean has taken temporarily. In the same way, what we have is consciousness, God, spirit, whatever word you use. And these bodies are metaphorically like our waveforms. We've never been anything but consciousness spirit. We're still consciousness spirit. And yet, there is this form that consciousness and spirit has come into temporarily. And part of the form it has come into has the mind. When I'm connecting, I'm not connecting mind to mind. That is for sure. It is definitely spirit to spirit, consciousness to consciousness. What the mind is, though, is a, a medium of consciousness. So, for example, take someone with Alzheimer's disease or any brain degenerative function. What happens is they obviously start to forget. But along with forgetting, it's not just that they forget their phone number or forget their name. There are people who have been their loved ones, their spouses, their children for 40, 50, 60 years who they don't even recognize. Now, from a neurologic standpoint, what we know is that Alzheimer's does not affect the heart. It's not that it's turned love into hate or love into indifference. What Alzheimer's does is it is degenerating the connections, the dendritic connections between the neurons in our brain. Okay, so does that then mean that love lives in dendrites? Right? I mean, I realize we've gotten slightly deeper than I was intending to go, but it's... Stay with me for a moment because it's actually... It's actually really beautiful and wonderful. We all understand that love does not exist in our dendrites. When you love someone, I mean, think for a moment about someone you love. Just bring them into your awareness for a moment. Someone you just deeply, fully, unconditionally love. Or something. It doesn't have to be a person. Where do you feel it? Mm, in the heart, right? Anybody feel it in their dendrites? Okay. And yet, when we lose the dendrites, what happens to the love? So this is, this is something that on a personal level has actually fascinated me from both a spiritual side and a scientific side. Watching someone with Alzheimer's disconnect. You think, well, where in the world did that love exist? I mean, it feels so deep. It feels of the heart. It feels of the spirit. Love is not up here in our neurotransmitters. And that's true. And yet, the brain, the very physical, chemical, electric brain is the vehicle for our awareness of love. The same way that the eyes are the physical vehicle for our awareness of sight. The eyes don't see, the brain sees. But your brain could be in perfect shape, cover your eyes, you cannot see. Doesn't matter how great your brain is. So what our sense organs are, whether it's our eyes for sight, our ears for sound, is they are, they are the vehicles, the mediums through which we experience sight or sound in the same way 
the brain or the mind as we think of it, the physical mind, is the vehicle through which we experience consciousness and all that it includes, like love. It doesn't live there. But what we know through watching people with brain damage, through watching people with, whether it's degenerative illnesses, whether it's a stroke, whether, whatever it is, is you need the brain to function in order for there to be consciousness. So what you're connecting to is spirit, but you're connecting through the brain, through the mind. And I'm going to leave you with one more, one more piece of where science and spirituality intersects with this. There are now machines. We've all seen brain reading machines where they hook up electrodes to your brain and then there's a little monitor next to it that shows the waves of your brain. They now can do that without the electrodes actually touching your skull. They actually can now do brain scans with a machine where the electrodes sit a few inches outside of your skull. Now, if you realize the implication of that, it is phenomenal. What it means is everything we are thinking, we are literally projecting. I mean, We've all been in the situation with someone and you think, I know this person is thinking horrible thoughts about me. Or, this person is such love. Right? I mean, there's certain people in whose presence you just want to keep sitting, keep sitting, keep sitting. And there's other people in whose presence, for whatever reason, you just know that it's not going to work. What we now know scientifically is it's literally the brain is emitting waves that are physical waves, energy waves that can be picked up and read on these machines. So through the mind as the vehicle, we are absolutely sending things out into the universe which have literal frequency ripple impacts and ripple effects. But ultimately what's connecting is spirit. The mind is the vehicle like the eyes are the vehicle of sight. But we don't really see with the eyes. The waves are what are being sent out. But what's generating them? What's generating it? If I die but I die from a heart attack or I die because I swallow poison, something that has nothing to do with my brain, something entirely shoulders down. So I've got a brain that is fully intact, but I'm now dead. My brain's not emitting anything. So that which is emitting is the soul, the spirit. But it's using the vehicle that we are in, the body. Look, when you love someone and you reach out and you hug them, what's hugging them? What's giving them love? Your fingers? It's coming from within. It's your heart, it's your spirit, it's the love. It's not in your fingers, but you could love someone all you want, and if you didn't have arms, you still couldn't hug them. There could be the presence of love, but not the mechanism of transmitting it. So the spirit is the source. Through my arms, I'm reaching out and touching you with love. Through my brain, I'm sending these frequencies out into the world. 
but the source is spirit. Because when the soul leaves the body at the time of death, it doesn't matter how good shape your brain is in, it's no longer doing anything. It doesn't matter how good shape your hands are in, they're no longer touching someone with love. That source is the spirit. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. How do you be nurturing and caring without being overbearing? This is something that comes up so frequently, particularly between parents and children, sometimes between spouses. We want to nurture. We want to care. We want to love. We want to take care. But frequently... The recipient of our caring, of our nurturing, typically our children, feel like it's, it's too much. So you hear frequently, Mom, I know you care. Or Dad, I know you care. But it's just, it's, it's too much. So how do, we, how do we find that line? Real nurturing is never overbearing. And the reason is that we give and nurture so freely that the recipient is able to just take what they need. So for example, you have trees that have wonderful nourishing soil, sun that shines on them, water that comes on them, But you never see the trees complaining. Oh my God, this soil is just much too rich for me. Or, oh, the the rain is just way too nutrient-filled. Or, wait, there's too much photosynthesis going on from the sun. Somebody turned down the rays of the sun. Rather... What they're able to do is take up as much as they need. So when you get the first rains after a drought, all of the greenery is sucking up all that water because they're thirsty, they're dry. But after it's been raining for a while, this is where we start to get runoff because the trees have absorbed as much as they need. The plants have absorbed as much as they need. The soil has absorbed as much as it needs. And we get runoff. If you are catching a cold or a flu or feeling like your immune system is a little down and you you take vitamin C, well, vitamin C is great for the immune system. The body absorbs as much of it as it can use. And it just passes the rest out. You might get slightly loose motions. It might come out in your urine. Because the body is going to only absorb as much as it can use. 
So when we're looking at our relationships, if really what we're doing is nurturing, it'll never be overbearing because the recipient will be able to do exactly what the trees do with the water and the soil, exactly what we do with things like vitamin C, is we use as much as we need We're nourished and nurtured as much as we need. And then the rest of it just flows off us. So you're sitting at the dinner table. Mom has given you a beautiful dinner. You're hungry. You allow yourself to be nurtured, nourished, you eat. Then you're full. So you're done. There may still be plenty of food sitting on the table, but you're done. The overbearing comes in where it's eat one more chapati, just one. Got them, got them. It's really hot and nice. Just eat it. Now, now you're nourished already. You're done. You're no longer hungry. The hunger has been satiated. You're full. So that, that extra chapati or that extra push for the sweet, the dessert, or just a little more of this, just more of that, is no longer nourishing. Now what I'm doing is I'm pushing it on you, not for you, but for me. I claim that I'm being nourishing, but I'm actually not, because this isn't for you. This is for me. It would be like if I were the rain and I were coming down and the tree had already absorbed as much water as it needed and its leaves were already green and plump. But instead of allowing it to just let me run off, I literally started, you know, on the trunks of the tree, on the leaves, open up, open up, let me in. This is when you get floods. This is when trees die. This is when they get uprooted. If we don't allow the water to run off and the soil gets so wet, the roots come up and the trees fall over. So you can't say that's, that's nourishing. That's when it starts to become, and of course it happens in nature also, we have times of flood, But nobody would say, oh, that flood was so nourishing. We understand that the flood is destructive. Rain is nourishing. Floods are destructive. So in our lives and our relationships, it's important to understand where what I'm doing is for you and where that ends and where it starts being for me. I need you to eat this because I cooked it. I need you to eat this because my afternoon went into it. And if you don't eat it, then my afternoon was wasted. I need you to eat this because in my concept of showing love, one of the things that we do so frequently is we show love through food. It's very common, especially in Indian families, but in so many other cultures as well. When when you're being fed, it's not that people are literally trying to stuff us to the point of pain. It's not that, that people really want us to be so full that we can't stand up from the table. It's, this is my love in the form of a chapati. It's my love in the form of a ladu. It's my love in the form of kheer. It's not the actual rice or the grains or the chapati. It's this is my love. And so it's important for us to understand that both the recipients of it and the givers of it, that really what we're talking about is love. One of the things on a personal level that I've learned to do here is to be able to say to people, can I have this love in the form of a hug instead of another chapati? 
I understand that the reason you want me to have another chapati is because you love, not so that my stomach should burst. And I, I appreciate your love. Thank you for your love. I want your love. But can I have it in the direct form? Give me a hug. Let me skip the chapati and just give me a hug. Because it's important to understand really what we're talking about. We're not talking about wheat or basin or rice. We're talking about love. And so when we're, when we're giving it, remember that what we're giving is love. And if it's really love, then it should be for the other person, not for me. And what that means is that they're able to take and absorb as much as they need and that I allow the excess to run off them. I may be unable to control myself. Sometimes the rain just comes. Sometimes the sun just comes. Sometimes I may want to just keep feeding you. But I allow them to let it run off. I allow them to say, no, no thanks. And move on. I don't need to push it on them. When it becomes about me instead of them, that's when it's overbearing instead of nourishing. So keep checking in with yourself. Is this really for them? Or is this for me? And the minute it stops being for them and it starts being for me, that's when you know you've shifted from nourishing to overbearing. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. What is seva in general? And specifically, what is seva here at Parmar? So in general, the word seva tends to be used colloquially as a term volunteering. I'm volunteering, I'm doing seva. It means I'm working, but for the benefit of someone else. Usually when we work, we work for our own benefit. I'm going to make money, I'm going to climb the career ladder, the corporate ladder. I'm going to become famous. I'm going to become very, very wealthy. Whatever it is, I'm working something for me. So seva is when I work for others. But it is even more than that. That's if we just say it's like volunteering. But seva is actually even deeper. Seva is actually a, a spiritual path. Volunteering is great. Back in your countries, maybe there's a, 
a blind school for blind children, or maybe there's a battered women's shelter, or maybe there's a homeless shelter, or maybe there's an old age home, or some place that you, once a week, once a month, periodically, go and you serve and you do volunteer work. It's wonderful. But Seva has that wonderfulness and more. Because Seva is actually spiritual practice. And the way that Seva is spiritual practice is it connects us with those we are serving. So usually when we serve, we think of it as me over here serving you over there. So maybe I'm feeding you, maybe I'm a doctor and you're a patient and I'm giving you some operation, maybe I'm teaching you something. Very nice, but it keeps us separate. Me here, you there. Seva, because it's a spiritual practice, it's focused actually on connecting us to the world. So in seva, it's not me over here serving you over there. It's not me as a humanitarian serving the masses. Seva is not those who have serving those who don't have. The highest goal of seva the highest and deepest, both highest, deepest, goal is to see myself in you. So I'm not serving you as separate. I'm serving you as I serve myself. So if my hand itches and I scratch it, I do that because this hand is very nice to this hand. It scratches because it understands we're all one. That's the way that we serve in seva. So seva connects us. But seva does one more, so many more, but one more that I'll talk about. One more aspect that is part of our spiritual practice. Seva purifies us. See, if I'm just doing service or I'm volunteering or I'm a humanitarian, that's increasing my sense of self-identity. Oh, I'm this great humanitarian. You know, every Saturday I do this or I do that. You know, I I make so many sandwiches for the poor people and then I distribute them. That becomes an aspect of my identity, an aspect of my ego. Even though it's good that I'm feeding the poor, the goal is not that my ego increases, that my sense of self increases. So when I'm serving... In seva, the goal is that I should become empty. That I should be used just as a vessel for God's will. So it's not me making the sandwiches. It's not me going and painting the homeless shelter. It's not me reading to the blind children. It's not me stuffing those envelopes or going door to door. I'm just a vehicle, like this microphone's a vehicle. This microphone would never stand up and say, please give me a round of applause. Please recognize I'm the best microphone. It understands. It's just, it's just a tool. It's not expecting some special appreciation that because it serves me so well here, I should, you know... Come back in every hour just to say, thank you, microphone. Thank you, microphone. That I should feed it special food. It's just a tool. And that's that's what seva does for us, is it purifies us to remove our sense of ego, 
to remove our sense of identity so that we can just be a tool for God's will, for the plan. And the last important part of that is, the beautiful thing then is, we don't have a set sense in our mind of what I'm going to do. This microphone has no idea what I'm going to speak. All it knows is, I have to be a tool. It doesn't even know if it's me who's going to speak. Whether it's Puja Swamiji giving blessings, whether it's Puja Swamiji chanting or singing, whether it's me speaking, anything else, whoever comes in here, maybe something else is going on and we have to make an announcement. This microphone is on for whatever service needs to flow through it. It's not like it says, I will only work if somebody's chanting Vedic mantras. Or I will only work if Puja Swamiji is chanting Vedic mantras. Or I will only work certain days of the week, certain weather, certain time. It understands that its, its role is just to be a tool, whatever is needed, whenever it's needed. And in the same way, when Seva purifies us, it removes that sense from us of, this is what I do. I sing, I speak, I chant, I talk about this, I talk about that. Microphone says, I'll only work if you talk about peace. No. No. Whatever we talk about, whatever the need is in the moment, the microphone is on. But if it were full of its own ego that says, I'm a microphone only for chanting, or I'm a microphone only for lectures on peace, then it's not being a proper tool. So seva is actually our spiritual path. Puja Swamiji always says, it's not seva and sadhana. Sadhana is usually what we use for our spiritual practice, the word, our spiritual practice, sadhana. But they're not two separate things. He always says seva is sadhana. Because when I meditate, whatever type of meditation I do, it doesn't matter. But if I'm really meditating, in that meditation, I'm having an experience that I'm not this body. I'm having an experience that I'm connected to the spirit. I'm connected to the universe. And when I have that experience of being connected, then naturally I'm going to serve. Service or seva then becomes the most natural byproduct of our meditation. And that's why if, if we don't want to serve, he doesn't say there's something wrong with your seva. He says there's something wrong with your meditation. If your meditation is on, the seva will be on. If the seva isn't on, it means that your meditation is not giving you that experience that it should be giving you. So the two of them, seva and sadhana, are really just two different faces, two different aspects of the same spiritual practice. And in fact, there's many people who say, well, I don't like to sit and meditate. We have doctors who come, for example, people in the garden or people in the schools who say, I, I'm not much of a closed-eye meditator. I feel closest to God when I'm serving. I feel closest to God when I'm operating on people. I feel closest to God if I'm planting in the garden. And that's great. There's no rule that says sadhana equals 
sitting in a dark room with your eyes closed and your legs crossed. Sadhana is what connects us. And so save is a very, very important aspect of that. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.